Welcome everyone to our panel on faith in politics. Uh, my name is Amar Patel. I was uh, formerly the ASP chair and I got the had the privilege of running with Brian Carroll in the 2020 presidential election as his vice presidential running mate. Uh, and I'm honored and uh, very, very privileged to have been asked to be the moderator of this panel. And so uh, today we are joined by some illustrious guests. And so I'm going to put in the comments in a little bit here their full bios because i feel like they really are do their their uh their full stories but i'm going to just give a quick short bio dr karen swallow Pryor is a professor at southeastern baptist theological seminary she's a prolific author a well-traveled speaker an avid reader and of course the legendary and notorious ksp on twitter <laughs> gloria purvis is a catholic speaker and author on religious pro-life and racial justice issues she hosts the Gloria Purvis podcast and hosted the Morning Glory show on EWTN until its unceremonious cancellation on December 30th, 2020, which will be a topic of discussion today. And Ron Del Trevino is a pastor, speaker, author, and founder and director of the Immigration Coalition, a faith-based nonprofit that provides clean drinking water at the U.S.-Mexico border and clean water sources in the native lands of migrants and refugees. So welcome to our Faith and Politics panel. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. All right. So uh, one of the things I want to start with is there's so many things that we could talk about with regards to faith in politics or faith and politics. Mm -hmm. What I really want to focus on is something that came out of a conversation I have had with Monsignor Stuart Swetland, uh, who is a uh, Catholic uh, priest, but also a radio talk show person on Relevant Radio. And he told me that a major crisis in the United States is that too many religious people allow their politics uh, to inform their faith instead of letting their faith inform their politics. And so that's how I want to frame a lot of this conversation, and especially with, within your expertise and things that you, your life experiences. And so we're going to start with uh, Karen. You recently had the opportunity to attend the Southern Baptist Annual Convention where, among other things, issues like uh, critical race theory and abortion abolitionist, uh, abolitionism were addressed. So I want you to share your thoughts on your experience there uh, in light of that framework of politics too strongly informing faith amongst your fellow Baptists. Yes, thank you. That's um, uh, Just to clarify, I did not attend in person simply because of uh, ongoing COVID concerns, although I was scheduled to go and, and speak, but I, I followed it very closely, obviously, as a, a Southern Baptist and as a, uh, a professor at one of uh, the Southern Baptist Convention seminaries. And we knew going in that um, critical race theory was a very um, divisive issue uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention and would be uh, during uh, the time of both electing our current um, convention president, as well as um, certain resolutions that were being offered. And this really is a reflection, I think, of not just the Southern Baptist Convention, but our, our whole nation and what we've seen in politics in the last, you know, in, in the last several years, but obviously in the last 400 years as well. Um, and so this, we knew going in, this would be the case, and it, and it, and it was the case um, in terms of electing our convention president, because we had, um, you know, we had the, the two top tier candidates ended up being the one who is known for his work on racial reconciliation. And then the other one in the runoff was the one who is most vocally opposed to CRT. Uh, and so uh, the pastor, Ed Litton, known for his work in racial reconciliation, particularly in the past couple of years following um, you know, the very recent high profile cases did win. So, um, but again, the convention came out pretty fairly divided. So that doesn't mean that the issue is over. Uh, and then I think some of us were surprised that this um, resolution on abortion, which takes an abolitionist approach, was approved. Um, a number of SBC ethicists have spoken out against it because it not only does it um, disavow 
incrementalism, um, but it also does not make an exception for the life of, of the mother. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm very glad that the convention still uh, does adhere to a strong uh, pro-life conviction. And I think perhaps many voters didn't just, just don't necessarily nuance all of those issues out. But in terms of your your overarching framework of a question um, about faith and politics, for me as a Baptist and particularly a Southern Baptist, um, you know, for us, religious liberty is very important because in the history of our of our country, um, Baptists were early on uh, persecuted and not allowed to to worship. So, uh, religious liberty for all religions, not just Christian and not just the Baptist denomination, is a foremost concern. Um, and yet, of course, we live in this tension because we because we believe in religious liberty, yet we have strong convictions about human life and human dignity um, that transcends our denomination. I mean, we can't simply say uh, about human life and, and human dignity that that we're going to observe our own personal religious beliefs because um, we want to advocate for all human life, regardless of of. Uh, the religion or the beliefs of a community. Um, but that also means for me, not just unborn life, but all human life. Um, anyone who is oppressed and vulnerable um, needs to have more protection rather than less protection. Um, but again, as a Baptist, I think that that is a tension that we, that we live in. And, it, and it's not surprising that it manifests the way that it does because we believe so much in... Um, advocating for um, our principle. We're, we're an evangelical denomination, so that means that we want to convince and persuade and win and advocate, and so it's easy for us to mistake political victory for victory in that, in that persuasion, um, and so for me as a Baptist, it is a difficult tension, uh, and I think we maybe don't think about how to balance that tension enough, but for me that, I mean, that's one of many reasons why I continue to be Baptist, because I think that we are a denomination that um, is defined by the attempt uh, to do this difficult thing, to balance religious liberty with personal freedom at the same time that we want to see the, the flourishing of all human beings. That's fantastic. Uh, it, you know, one of the things I, I've been doing a lot of reading just to kind of prepare for this and to, uh, you know, kind of get your perspective. And it, it saddens me to, and I'm going to kind of transition over to Gloria, because uh, very similarly in the way that a lot of the language and the reviews about what happened at the convention were couched in the idea of liberal Baptists versus conservative Baptists, which whenever I see that in with regards to Catholics, and I want to get Gloria's take on this, I just always look at that as a ridiculous thing because that doesn't apply to people of faith in the construct of the way we use those terms in the United States. So, so Gloria, you know, I think that you know, Karen explained her experience yeah. uh, with, you know, Speak about that, especially in, in, I think you might have a perspective with the, um, the election of 2020. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You saw a lot of that liberal Catholic, conservative Catholic stuff. Yeah, I, you know, uh, it's been a peculiar thing to me how we all say we believe in the dignity of the human person, but I think since George Floyd in a very um, clear way, we saw that that doesn't really mean every single person, right? And um, in talking about police brutality and talking about the history of racism in this country and talking about white supremacy made many, many, many of my fellow co-religionists uncomfortable. And, and I keep thinking, but if, if we are Catholic and we're talking about um, sin and we're talking about the things that divide the human family, why wouldn't we discuss those things? Why wouldn't we discuss a history that still impacts us today? And as Catholics, uh, speak, speaking as Catholics, we know that sin, the effects of sin can outlive the person who's done it. So what would 400 years of white supremacy embedded in the law, embedded in culture, tradition, practice, do to us today? And we all know that um, passing laws is not converting a human heart. And if you study any history and see what happened uh, 
even post emancipation, immediately after emancipation, you saw the the entrenched and often violent uh, resistance to the notion of black people being free and equal. I mean, it took a hundred years from that to get to the civil rights movement. And uh, we had these amendments to the constitution. So everybody would think that just passing laws does it. That's not what converts the people. And then, uh, to, and, and I started to see all of these things come to play around the murder of George Floyd. Why do I say that? Because all the myths about black criminality, all the myths about the black community came to play in how people even reacted to the video. So people who normally would be just so upset uh, with violence, uh, video, video of violence against the child in the womb, uh, could look at that video and instead of being, you know, like that, they would say, well, what did he do? As if there was something normal about brutalizing another human being in that way. And they also identified with the brutalizer, with the officer who was convicted of murder, Officer Chauvin, or former Officer Chauvin. They identified with him the rightness of his actions instead of seeing that he was a victim too. You know, he was a victim of a broken police culture. And as believers, I, I also was shocked to, for people not to understand that racism, the history of it not only harmed African-Americans, but it harmed white people too it really made them behave in ways less than who God made them to be. And if we don't understand that their own dignity as well was torn down by their free embrace of these lies that are contrary to the gospel, I think that we're missing the whole point. We talk about these things to liberate all of us from the grips of this evil. And, uh, and, and, and we have much work to do. But then I started to see, um, pardon me for saying this, but with the election of President Trump, a uh, decided turn in discussions about winning and jettisoning a lot of our values because this person they thought could win. And so what I saw was people not really, people willing to jettison their values for temporal power. And I knew that that was a seduction. I knew that was a seduction and you should not, um, in order to support a candidate, have to jettison the very core things that you value. Um, and, and I just thought you, you, we can't do that. We have to still critique whoever is in power because that's who we are, not that's who they are. And if we have certain values, it has to affect how we interact with our neighbors, how we talk about our neighbors, even the neighbors who are not yet citizens in this country. Um, our whole notion of freedom, uh, I think as Catholics, and I'm speaking specifically as a Catholic, we don't have a notion of freedom as being what, doing whatever you want. Freedom is the ability to do what is good. And so then I saw that sort of get further twisted and, and, and jettisoned. And, and this has been a long thing going. I won't just say it's been this past election, but even just the American idea of freedom is very different from what we as Catholics would understand freedom to be. And so to be in this space and to try to talk about the importance of the virtue, to talk about how we're gonna love our neighbor, how we even love our enemies, seem to just be jettisoned. And um, the racial rhetoric in terms of denying racism, denying that an evil exists, uh, really overtook uh, political you know, speaking and engagements I think that people had. But yet from a position of faith, we know that sin is real. We know that we are fallen. And yet somehow the sin of racism has been exempted from existing. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? I mean, it just didn't, it didn't make sense uh, from a theological perspective either. Um, and it certainly didn't make sense if you were even a modest student of history. I mean, no shade on people, but uh, to, to find out the kinds of things that people were not taught about the history of this country. And it doesn't mean we don't love America. It means we love America and want her to live up to her ideals. You know, And so just so many um, disturbing things started to happen in the political space um, around race that really challenged our value of uh, believing in the dignity of the human person and became very apparent to me that race and, and, and policing uh, seemed to be a breaking point for how far people would go in holding on to that value. And then lastly, because I know I'm talking long, lastly, I also think people didn't want to suffer the consequences of being faithful to what we believe. 
you know, you might be ostracized, you might even lose your job, you know, but, but, you know, we're called to follow the gospel um, no matter what. And, and I always laugh that people love the martyrs till they might have to be one. <laughs> well, yeah, on that fantastic note, I think you're exactly right. And I think, you know, you have to follow the gospel and not follow your political tribe. And I think that's a very common thread in both of what you and Karen had to say. Mm -hmm. it really leads me very well into what I want to speak to Rondell about is that uh, Rondell, you know, I, I kind of uh, started to follow you on Twitter because you were prolifically sharing that uh, you were politically homeless uh, because you were too pro-life to be a Democrat and too pro-justice to be a Republican and many variations, I think, on that theme. But kind of as Gloria was saying is that, you, you know, you refused uh, to take a blind eye to injustice along some kind of political line. So I want you to speak on kind of your experiences and the response you get from people, especially on social media, uh, from that perspective. Yeah, and and I echo Karen and Gloria and everything they say. And 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 personally, with my experience, it's it's heavily with with Latinos, immigrants, migrants, asylum seekers. The work that we do, and and it, go, it goes back to your first point. You know, when we allow, in my experience, when I when I've seen fellow Christians, when we when they allow uh, politics to inform their faith, then they become pro life for some. And that's it. And, and if it's comfortable, they'll be pro-life for them. And if it fits their political agenda, then they're going to be pro-life for those specific individuals. And so when that happens, then when you when I have seen what I have seen personally from brothers and sisters in Christ who I know have a relationship with the Lord, um, when they have, have seen asylum seekers over the last five or six years uh, and, and in need of love, a pregnant mother, a child, a kid, and yet be almost entrenched with xenophobia and fear that somehow this child is a threat to their existence in America. That's, that's a theme I saw, I have seen over the last five or six years uh, consistently. Now I will say I have seen a consistent amount of brothers and sisters in Christ who have come a long way in the discipleship process that we have partaking in building a relationship to be in proximity with churches, organizations, fellow Christians to think about these issues in a biblical manner. Um, and so as a, as a Christian, personally, for, for, for me, being pro-life from the womb to the tomb, uh, politically homeless, I, my main focus was wanting to say, I choose Jesus. I choose the gospel. And, and no matter if someone has documentation or not, they need food, they need water, they need the gospel, and it is my duty to, to go to them in proximity and to love them in that way. And again, it's a both end. I've, I've gotten uh, negative responses, <laughs> um, but God always allows me to get a, enough responses, and I'm sure Karen and Gloria speak this, enough responses to, con to continue going from brothers and sisters who see the work that we're doing that, that is deeply, that is deeply uh, needed. And so I, I believe one thing that I have noticed, even with the, the rise of the American Solidarity Party, is Christians are starting to embrace being more uncomfortable and being willing to be ostracized to be pro-life from the womb to the tomb for all humans, unborn pregnant mothers, documented immigrants, undocumented, undocumented immigrants, and to live in that tension, especially here with the Immigration Coalition, we're, we're staunchly trying to figure out how do we live in the tension of wanting to understand that we do need a, a multifaceted approach to border security, but we also need to show deep compassion to asylum seekers, migrants, and undocumented immigrants. It's easy to choose both sides, but when, I, when I'm informed from my faith, then I'm gonna live and have to live in that tension um, and, and have to rub shoulders with folks who might disagree with me on what border security looks like, but I can have those conversations. And I think that's what's missing within the church and within Christians uh, from Southern Baptists to non-denominational Christians to Catholics. What does it look like for us to get a seat at the table together and to come across with our differences, but at the same time be able to have these conversations in a kind and gracious way so that we can see uh, a pro-life from the womb to the tomb approach in our faith when it comes to racism, xenophobia, immigration where it may be, so that we can see a revival in, in what needs to happen in America. Fantastic. 
Uh, I think one of the things I want to uh, transition to, and it was a great question someone already posed uh, as a uh, the anonymous attendee. I don't know who this is, but uh, they you know they asked, where do you believe that religious liberty is most at danger in the United States? And so, uh, feel free to answer that question. But again, I want to frame it because again, we could talk about that. It's it's kind of a nebulous topic that goes into a lot of spaces. But I, I want to start with Gloria and uh, talk about a recent article you wrote about the painful history of uh, many white Catholics who fought against desegregation during oh, this yeah. movement. Oh, yeah. and so uh, in terms of religious freedom, you know, I think th there's a, th what you had said earlier, and Rondell touched on it as well in his response, is that we, we should not look at religious freedom just to kind of you know, have our safe space within church or, you know, writing articles or whatever, but to live the gospels. And I think that when you brought up a lot of these issues in that article, for example, uh, you know, the sensitivity, touch on that idea of, you know, being free to do what's good. You know, that's kind of how you phrased it. Like you know, to freedom is not doing whatever you want is to do what good and what is right. And um, that was a time where we still have pain from that sort of thing. And I think Karen can probably speak of that within uh, Baptist history uh, in terms of the religious freedom for persecution that Baptists had themselves, but also that was inflicted from Baptists to fellow Baptists. So I'll start with Gloria and then we'll come all the way around. Yeah, you know, uh, so let me just back up a little bit. Um, it, the article I wrote was based off a conversation I had with Professor Matthew Kressler, who's a historian at the College of Charleston. And he had done a he's been research, he does a lot of research and he'd uncovered the massive resistance to desegregation on the part of white Catholics. And he had some uh, very specific excerpts from the kinds of letters written to the Archbishop of Chicago at the time. And, um, you know, and a lot of times we like to tell ourselves, you know, as Catholics, oh, how we've done this and we've done that. But the truth of the matter is that during the civil rights movement, the people who were ca white Catholics and who were you know, for civil rights, actively for civil rights, weren't the majority. The vast majority of white Catholics were a part of the massive resistance, either actively resisting or just not stepping forward to defend uh, civil rights. Um, the kind of letters written to the bishop, even to the point of saying, I will not go to mass with Negroes and you will not make me. You know, the notion that the bishop would want to integrate not, I mean, just integrate within the diocese, like the, the schools, churches, all that uh, just was a, a, a place too far. Like, how dare you make us have to live with our neighbor and worse, our co people who believe like we do who are also Catholic. So it was just really mm -hmm. distressing to see these things, but to understand why wouldn't it have been that way? You know, if if um, the kind this is again the problem with racism, it didn't stop at the at the door of the church. It was very much also inside the church, uh, even so much so that it influences how people even understand what what Catholicism is. That it's largely uh, seen what is really more white Catholicism as white Catholics ethnically may have practiced it and whatnot. That scene is normative, whereas, you know, if, if you go to a Black Catholic church or even a church where uh, it's Latino or even maybe uh, uh, other populations with different styles of worship, that scene is something different when it's Catholicism as well, fully normal, 100% Catholicism. And um, so, you know, trying to grapple with that history and grapple with the reality of who we are in the church and how these things, the church hasn't, hadn't been a shield against it. I mean, you even had situations where black men were not allowed to be priests at one point because no bishop in the you know, U. Now these are particular things to the U.S. This is not, of course, across the world, but particular to the U.S. and our particular problems. So uh, people dealing with that and coming to grips with that, I think, uh, it, it has been painful for some, but we, we need to do that work. We need to talk about it uh, because it's not who we're supposed to be and what it's not according to our creed as Catholics. And this is where you see the disconnect between what we say we believe and how we live it. And then to have the, frankly, to have the courage, some of these bishops really needed a courage to go up against these white Catholics that were raging. It was like, we're not going to put money in the collection plate. We're in some cases, um, uh, uh, Professor Cressa was telling me people put black buttons or black balls in a collection plate to protest integration, to let the bishop know this is how we feel about integration, about 
basically having people live with us as our brothers and sisters in Christ and with all the full rights of being uh, citizens in this country as they should have had. So, um, and then you have, and let me just say this, you also have people say, oh, that was 50 years ago. And I was like, what makes you think that those attitudes from 50 years ago haven't seeped into everything else? Like, what, at what point did it evaporate? Please let me know and let me know what technique you all used to do it so we could cl quickly replicate it everywhere else. So people act as if time somehow automatically erases um, this grave evil. No, it takes effort. It takes specific effort. And it's not just going to fade away. It may change and become more sophisticated. Like no one uses uh, the, uh, the racial slurs, you know, publicly in terms of referring to people, but that doesn't mean the same kind of animus and attitudes that make people say those things has gone away. It's just, we know that in polite company, you don't do that but we need to get at the more sophisticated kinds of ways that people demean each other on a racial basis, you know? All right, Karen, what is your experience? Um, so the question is about the, the greatest danger to religious freedom and- Yeah, you know, with that, it can be in any context if you want. And also kind of maybe the, uh, you know, those issues of there really isn't freedom throughout like what you experienced in the Baptist convention for everyone. Right, right. And of course, to go back to Gloria's point, freedom is the freedom to do good. Um, and of course, you know, we, we as a, a democratic society are, we are also free to disagree on what is what is good. And that gets to the heart of, of our of our problems and our, our conflict. Um, yet we also, as people of faith, do believe in transcendent, eternal, absolute truth. Um, and if we're Christians, we believe that truth is found in scripture. And so in some ways, I, I think that um, some of the greatest danger, uh, dangers to religious freedom and to these issues that we're talking about is, is ourselves, um, because we have been... Um, not as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves in terms of of distinguishing first of all what truly is uh, a religious issue um you know the the segregation of schools was not anything divided by race is not in any means biblical or a religious issue um and yet it that it was played as such as we know um as, as gloria talked about i mean i i also come from a community um where uh where many institutions were including my my religious denomination and including my uh the school where i worked for 20 years th these places were founded in you know as um, attempts to escape um, government um, uh, desegregation, and that those things were were wrong, and so we have we have to carefully parse out what is true, scripturally true, versus what is cultural. I mean, and that's easy to say, but that is where we are in all of all of these struggles. Um, and so, again, to go back to that point about the tension. I mean, we as Christians and, and my people as Southern Baptists, we have strong convictions about, about human life, about anything uh, related to what it means to be a human person, um, including our sexuality, because it is through our sexuality that we, um, that we participate with God in the creation of his image. These are very important, um, important matters to us, yet at the same time, uh, because we also believe in religious freedom, we, we have to advocate for what we believe contributes to the most human flourishing, but also know that we can't um, compel those beliefs on other people. And so by failing to be wise as serpents and as gentle as doves, I think we have put ourselves oftentimes in, we have put ourselves in a corner. And so when, um, when other movements or people lash out at us, it's often because we have perhaps um, asked for too much. So for example, of course I want religious schools and institutions to be able to um, assemble freely as the first amendment guarantees with people of like-minded mind, belief. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, I, I want it to mean, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we get to be supported by government um, funds or taxes. Um, so we, we can't mistake government funding um, for the exercise of religious belief. But I think what's happening, I mean, it, we have to, um, 
you know, if we were born in and, and lived for many generations in a country that was not even nominally Christian, we would understand that we are guests, we are aliens. Um, but we have have had this assumption for a long time that we, you know, we believed that we are a Christian nation. And so we feel like we're losing rights that perhaps we never all had. Um, and so, uh, so I think we need to advocate again for the kind of freedom and democracy that is the American dream and the promise of America. We haven't yet attained it, but also understand um, that, uh, th that we have to ask for, for those things for everyone else as well, or else um, we are going to lose them. And I, and I think we feel that a little bit, we feel that threat. Um, and some of that is because we haven't been as discerning and as distinguishing between what we thought were our rights as Americans versus what's truly a biblical liberty. Thank you. Uh, so Wandel, I think one thing that I, I found uh, kind of heartbreaking, and then I want you to, you know, specifically in your realm, that uh, I think you passionately speak to the truth. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just talking about the gospel, uh, you know, asks you that, well, sorry, freedom is to do what is good. And so I, I saw several stories that, you know, the work, the mercy work that you do, uh, that some people were being arrested, you know, for that kind of work. And so, you know, the religious freedom, a lot of times you hear religious freedom framed in the light of, you know, what you can say and what uh, pastors can preach at the pulpit. Uh, but then also those who are, who are doing works of mercy to migrants and refugees and people, you know, putting out water in, at certain spots in the desert or even bringing water and, and having that be illegal. So have you experienced that? And, and then just your comments uh, on, on that sort of thing happening. Yeah, I, mean, I think there was one story that, you know, became pretty viral uh, not too long ago, three or four years ago, about a guy who was trying to provide water in the desert along the border and some, and somehow it was, you know, illegal to do, which it wasn't. Um, and and I, I think that speaks to the fact that when we don't protect religious freedom, then we can't show biblical kindness alongside someone who might not believe the same way, but cares about providing water. I can't tell y'all how many times I have uh, brothers and sisters of the Muslim community, uh, Southern Baptists, Catholics who come alongside and want to do work with us and and biblical kindness says you know I disagree with you maybe on some of the theological aspects or even religiously but I still want you at my dinner table and I still want to serve with you at the border uh, and I think if 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 we don't uh, if we don't protect religious freedom that's could, that could be a threat where we can where we can kindly and respectfully uh, serve one another and serve immigrants and migrants along the border in droves together. Um, on a consistent basis. And so oftentimes I've, I've, I have seen our organization personally thrive because we can serve alongside folks who might think religiously different, worship differently, vote differently. Um, and even, and even, it even helps us as an organization to help not force the gospel on somebody who might not, who might even be agnostic, if you will. We've had a couple of atheists who wanted to serve with us that allows us, with their religious freedom, that allows us to graciously build relationship with them over time and to show them the work of mercy that Jesus would have us do. Um, where we're throwing, uh, I say, breadcrumbs out of the gospel that hopefully one day they might come to know the Lord. And who knows if they don't, if they don't, then it's okay, but we get to do the work together. And so I think personally, as, as we do the work along the border, uh, the biggest threat from for, for our work is it, with, to religious freedom would be we 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 feel it's a huge blessing to work alongside people who might worship differently um, and and see how they worship differently in in their own in their own lives uh, to serve alongside together for migrants, asylum seekers, and, and undocumented immigrants in communities. I know Gloria, you had some. Oh, Gloria had them, yeah. Yeah, so one thing I wanted to say, you know, as I thought more about the threats to religious liberty, um, some things come to mind specifically, uh, people's misunderstanding religious liberty to meaning freedom to worship, 
that we're able to do things just within the four walls of our church building, not understanding religious li liberty speaks to how we live, you know, how I choose to live my life, and that the government cannot compel me to do things contrary to my conscience, contrary to what values I have. Um, also, I would say another threat to religious liberty is people um, thinking that because we have religious principles, that in and of itself disqualifies us from participating in the public square. They're wrong about that. That doesn't disqualify me. I have just as much right as anyone else um, to come forward with what I believe and, and to act upon that. And then thirdly, I would say another very big religious liberty threat are the people who use religious liberty as a means they aren't motivated by love, you know, and they are motivated more so by the opposite of love and them being the loudest people talking about things. And so we as believers motivated by love who are exercising our beliefs, we need to call those people out, you know? Uh, so, so exa for example, people remember the Klan using scripture improperly, right? And I was like, and they were wrong, but we also have to remember that the civil rights movement had a Christian ethos. Martin Luther King, the whole movement was a Christian, so was the abolitionist movement. And so we can't allow the bad examples to be the ones that carry the day, because I think that heavily influences how people are seeing issues around sexual morality. They don't imagine that there are people who could be motivated by love and just a different understanding of um, the sexual gifts that God has given us. But it doesn't mean I hate you. I this. It doesn't even mean that I don't want you to live. It just means I want to live according to what I believe and not participate in, or or be forced to provide things that, that are contrary to what we believe about the goodness of the human person, marriage, family, sex, all of that. But it doesn't mean I, don't, I want to destroy and have these other people not live. And so when you have people who are demagogues trying to be the, the to carry the message, we got to tell them to sit down and hush because they are the problem, you know, people point to them and 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 it, and 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 liken it to the clan, and people have the memory of that. And so we need to very much be very clear to tell those people to sit down and hush because they don't have the right right uh, inner uh, orientation toward their fellow brother and sister uh, in Christ. Okay, this is a rich conversation. I think we could probably have done two hours on this, but I really wanted to get your thoughts on one more thing. Uh, and you could probably get like seven minutes each on this. But uh, so I like to, I, I'm going to call this Patel's theory for lack of better terms, but I've always felt and I've always said that everyone has a natural disposition that leans a little bit more towards mercy, or it leans a little bit more towards justice. And as Christians, we believe that God is perfectly just and perfectly merciful, right? But as human beings, we're, we're just tilting one way or another naturally. But then when our government is a duopoly, it's a two-party system, what happens, and this is my, my theory uh, that I'll let you respond to, is that we're unnaturally stretched and pulled kind of like in a Stockholm syndrome in one direction. Whichever way you lean, you get sucked that way and you forget about the other important part of, of the nature of God. So, uh, you know, you go towards an unhealthy permissiveness or an unrealistic legalism. And I think those are the two ways I kind of see how the two parties often construct things. And so um, first I'll, I'll kind of frame this for Karen. Uh, you recently shared uh, an article on Twitter from David French that was a response to the uh, Southern Baptist Convention. And I think he framed the discussion that uh, among Southern Baptists, you have fundamentalists and evangelicals. There was a lot of pushback on your Twitter thread, um, and I think uh, it, it all fell kind of in a political way. So if, if you want to comment on that in, in Patel's theory. Oh, I, I love your theory, actually, um, and I think I've had in my mind a version of this. Um, I've expressed it over the years, um, especially with my students, that, you know, the Bible um, admonishes us to speak the truth in love. And I've said that oftentimes Christians are, you know, they're truth people or they're love people. Um, and, you know, we really have to hold, again, both intention. And um, and so, and I will, I will get to the conservative versus fundamentalist part, but this, that you've really hit on my sweet spot here because um, in the past few years, I've done a lot of research and writing on virtue ethics and virtue is that moderation or that sort of golden mean uh, between uh, deficiency and excess. 
And so justice and mercy are these two things that are in you know, sort of a, a tension there in crux. Um, and we have to hold them in balance with one another in order to be to be virtuous people to have a virtuous society and so i think we can kind of begin with understanding that um that they need to be in balance and also that as you said we do tend usually as people uh toward one or the other and then um your application of that to the two-party system is just is brilliant i think that does explain a lot um and you know, uh, uh, I, I, I actually feel like, it, you know, it's a, it's a strength and a weakness um, for me that um, I feel the pull of both pretty equally. And I don't mean that as sort of a cheating answer, <laughs> um, but it actually in some ways does make it difficult because I have the, the conflict within, within myself. Um, but this is, this is another way of talking about uh, what David French was talking about in, and, and again, these terms conservative, uh, evangelical fundamentalist and then the terms you referred to earlier conservative li liberal and moderate I, I actually have sympathy with a lot of our secular religion uh, journalists um, uh, who are trying to describe these things because uh, uh, even within the conservative community such as the Southern Baptist denomination which is conservative there can be people who go further to the right than the others and so um it's hard to come up with words that aren't already laden with meaning like moderate or liberal in those conversations we, we need more words i guess um and so so yes what in french's article he was really diagnosing the fact that 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 even within the southern baptist convention um we have people who who are more fundamentalists and they would be more the legalist more the, the truth or justice or uh, justice law people um and then evangelicals who i think traditionally and historically do strive more for the middle but others you know the, our critics would say that we are too um left-leaning or too liberal with our mercy um so i don't i mean i think this is actually a very helpful rubric that you you've offered and um i think it's also important why and, and you know i'm not getting paid to say this but this is why something like the american solidarity party is so important to kind of um to to provide tension to that to that binary to that dialectic um the these old binaries these old categories just don't work anymore this goes back to something rondell was saying earlier that we have a thriving growing um, community of Christians from across the board who just simply do not follow, uh, who don't fit into the categories of Republican and Democratic. And so I don't think that it's, those categories are going to last anymore. Um, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a healthy challenging and breakup of that so that those of us who really want to be consistent um, in all of these life areas um, have a vision for how to do that. I'm not saying this party is the perfect answer, there is none, um, but at least we have a mod, we can see past um, the stronghold of the old categories. And I feel like I've gone on, so I'll stop there. Oh, great, great answer. And I appreciate that you like my ideas. So that's, that's great. <laughs> um, so Gloria, I think, you know, like the, uh, the elephant in the room, I think that we need to talk about, especially within this context is that we have a Catholic president. And throughout the entire uh, election cycle, uh, there was just so much vitriol, painful vitriol amongst Catholics, uh, like on social media, for example, you know, using the things like you can't be Catholic and a Democrat, you know, uh, and then yeah. Catholics, uh, and we have a lot of, uh, you know, friends that are in the, the Democrats for life that are, yeah. you know, in our space, in our, in our ASP space. And yeah, who we have strong connections with. And of course, you know, they clearly had to fight a special kind of fight, you know, in that process. So, so what are your thoughts as, so with someone who is a thought leader in both racial justice issues, as you've already described, but also a, a pro-life leader in uh, several boards that you sit on, um, you know, it, it, how do you propose, uh, not just for Catholics, but Christians and any believers to kind of bring all of those issues into a correct alignment? Yeah, I mean, we have to sit and have the talk, right? And um, we shouldn't be defending President Biden where he's fallen down in uh, promoting policies that are contrary to human flourishing, contrary to the um, protection of the 
child in the womb and her mother, because women are also uh, victims uh, of abortion, considering the violence that happens inside their bodies to the child in their body. And I think it, it also grows, goes to show that we haven't really grappled with what it is to be a woman in our country and have to work, to have the mother, and how we even organize work in this country are, in my opinion, not conducive to motherhood, uh, even the attitudes in our workplaces. So we talk about a right to choose, you know, people say that, right? But we haven't looked at whether or not, is that really a choice <laughs> when you have the kind of uh, policies we have about paid family leave, maternity leave, uh, the, those kinds of things. I mean, it's just not conducive to a family flourishing, at least in my opinion, it, it isn't. And so we, we need to change the whole way in which we think about the economy, right? So I think um, I, I'm like, let's just, the, even the framing we have now does not work. And so we can't just simply say and think it's going to work that we need to make abortion uh, illegal, right? I'm, uh, you know, we do need to have, I think, pursue uh, a protection of life in the womb. But I also think we also need to have every single policy that makes uh, protecting life in the womb make sense for the people who are having these children. And I also think we need to get away from a lot of the stigma toward them. I was very appalled to see so many um, people who claim to be pro-life put up this graph that showed um, uh, African-American women having a lot of um, racial graphs according to having uh, children out of wedlock and I was thinking, wow, that's really pro-life. The people, these women are choosing to have children in what may not be the most ideal circumstances. And instead of seeing that, what people chose to do was try to make a commentary about the morality of black people. And I was like, wait a minute now, we can't have it both ways. We can't say, please have your children under difficult circumstances. And then when people do that, we then say you're these awful immoral people. What are we doing? So I think we need to change the conversation, really look at the, what are the building blocks of how things are in this country. And we need to challenge our leaders like President Biden to be consistent. We want you, yes, to treat people correctly at the border. We want you, yes, to treat the poor correctly. And we also want you, yes, to also support women and the children uh, in their wombs and the fathers, all of that. We want a pro-family atmosphere in the government and in um, private industry, but it all begins with having these conversations. Um, so uh, I, I think that's very important. I also think we, we need to understand what justice is. Um, I think sometimes we have too punitive a thought about justice. And so well, justice is really giving people what they are due, right? Um, and rather than punishing people. Now, in some cases, of course, justice does require punishment, but the punishment should be, uh, in my opinion, something that we consider a wrong done to an individual is a wrong done to the whole order of the community. And so how do we correct that thing that brought disorder into the community, right? And we're not talking about revenge against the person or anything like that. So I think even talking about justice uh, in the conception of what it means is something that we'd have to do. And what is mercy? You know, is mercy saying that we let people just do these things that harm the community and have no consequence? No, that's not what we're saying either, but it has to be uh, a kind of just mercy, if you will. It can't be, um, and if you talk about the criminal justice system, we see that the kinds of penalties for similar crimes, uh, if you measure across race or income level, you'll see that the poor person of color gets the worst sentence, oftentimes a death penalty in some cases. Uh, so there's a lot that we have to unpack and examine uh, in our country. And I think we need to just change the conversations. Um, so the economy doesn't, we need an economy that supports women. Okay, rather than telling women that our fertility is a barrier or a burden to our full participation in the economy. So just a few, those a few points. Great, great thoughts. And uh, so Rondell, your, your missionary work is, is apolitical, uh, but I'm sure you have a, a sense, a pulse on immigrant political sensibilities. Uh, and also as a, as a child of an immigrant myself, I mean, you know, I, I have a direct connection to 
you know, Indian immigrants and their sensibilities. Um, I think one of the things that you mentioned earlier today, as, as you were on in an interview, is that uh, I want you to know if, if you have a sense of how this population kind of breaks the political thought structure, especially in light of the results that uh, Donald Trump received an increased percentage amongst Latino voters, as you mentioned, in several districts. And I think that that really shocked a lot of pundits uh, that were all of a sudden confused by why they weren't voting how they should be voting or whatever. Uh, so uh, I'd love your thoughts on that with regards to Patel's theory of people lean, you know, in either way, naturally, yeah. you can't dictate to them. Yeah, I, I think one thing I said when we when we heard about the results of the Latino immigrant vote in Florida and specifically along the border, if you look at the results, it was primarily Latinos who were voting more conservatively along the border, which was a surprise for folks. And what it, what it says is you can't put your thumb on the Latino community and vote and what we think. Um, and it also says that Latinos and immigrants are not a monolith. Some of our first generation family members are more conservative. Uh, we are pro-life from the womb to the tomb. Oftentimes there's this uh, this myth that uh, Latinos in general are more progressive. Uh, and I would say it, it goes from generation to generation. More of our older abuelitas, uh, uh, abuelos, uh, grandpas and, and grandmas are, are more conservative. Um, and I have family members who are more conservative in the older realm who voted for Trump. But I also have family members who were uh, more progressive. And so what this speaks is, uh, uh, what this speaks to is both parties and even the American Solidarity Party, it's time to pay attention to the Latino and the immigrant vote when it comes to what do we really believe? And what are the things that we, we, truly, we truly care about? I, I wanna touch quickly on your mercy and justice. And I think, Glory, Glory I was gonna say the exact same thing. We have to get back to understanding what does justice even mean? Because I think people who lean more right or lean more left or lean more towards justice and lean more towards mercy wouldn't even probably understand your theory. <laughs> when they saw it, it looks, it, it's, it's just, it's confusing because they're so used to one way or the other. Tim Keller, one of my heroes, he wrote a, a fascinating book. It, it's one of the most important books that I continue to read uh, every year and go to uh, on generous, it's called Generous Justice. And he talked about biblical justice means exactly what Gloria said, giving somebody what they're due, either punishment or protection or care. And when I look at that in the lens of immigration, oftentimes people think that justice who are more conservative, they think that justice is, just means punishment. And then all my, my progressive brothers and sisters think that justice just means care and protection. Now there is a sense of we need to make sure that the punishment is for their flourishing, for them to grow, right? We want them to grow, we want them to become better people in society, but it's a both and. And so what that happens, when you look at an undocumented mother who comes undocumented, has lived in the United States for the last 25 years, can't get right with the law because the system's so broken. Biblical justice, when we look at every narrative of an undocumented immigrant, when we see her and how she has benefited and done great in America and become a better neighbor to people, and oftentimes a Christian, what biblical justice would tell me is, oh, there might be an approach where they did come undocumented, we will we'll make them pay a fine of some sort, but we're gonna allow her to stay. So we're gonna give her justice in a way that does make her pay a fine for staying in the country and for coming undocumented. But at the same time, we're gonna allow her to stay in the country because she helps us thrive. She helps us thrive. Now, when it comes to somebody who might be an, uh, an immigrant, which there are bad apples in every group, that might be someone who's human trafficked, who has drug traffic, does not wanna change. Biblical justice would tell me, I do want this person to flourish. I want this person to even come to know the Lord one day. But justice would tell me because of their actions, uh, they need punishment in the sense of even being detained and even being uh, deported if that is necessary at that point. So when we're able to see and use justice and mercy when we see an individual like an immigrant or asylum seeker, then we're going to understand that we have to go on the basis of everybody's narrative is different. <laughs> and I have to listen to everybody's story. And based on their story, I have to apply biblical justice in the right way for their flourishing uh, and hopefully that they come to someone who might know uh, the Lord. And so I just wanted to quickly just say that's been my experience, how I try to approach it when it comes to loving immigrants and caring for them at the border. Um, and I think there's more Latinos because you saw the very diverse groups of Latinos and immigrants voting differently. They see that there are more of my brethren who are Latinos who are more in that middle and trying to figure out what does that mean so I think we have to do a good work, the American Solidarity Party, 
carrying glory. We have to do a better work of what does it look like us? We're on level 10. I think we have to be willing to get in proximity and start at level one. What does biblical justice 101 mean? And get in proximity to, to people to help them understand what does this actually mean and how do we move forward uh, so that we can we can live a, a, a better life for, for uh, our Americans and our Christians and brothers and sisters in America, so. You guys, this has been amazing. Uh, you know, one final thought I wanted to share, just listening to all this and trying to bring it together for our attendees and, and uh, maybe you guys would have 30 seconds to even have a final response if you could. But, I, you know, uh, I, I wanna say that last year, um, you know, when, when George Floyd was murdered, I kind of was looking at that and I saw in an article where it said he was 46. And I was 46 when I read that article, you know, and I thought to myself, you know, we're the same age. I mean, just for the, by the grace of God, we, I was not in that position. I could have been him and he could have been me. Um, and just kind of reflecting on just kind of justice and in my space within the American Solidarity Party. And I just kind of re, uh, was thinking about uh, faith within, with regards to this per, per, uh, particular political issue, but it goes with immigration. It goes with really any political issue is that to me, solidarity means carrying your brother's cross, right? It's not simply, you know, empathizing with them and, and walking a mile in their shoes and, you know, how people say that sort of thing. But I, I think as Christians, we have to take it to that level of it, it's the suffering with your brother or sister. Um, and, and I think in the life realm, all of those issues, I feel like, um, you know, the greatest threat in, in my mind to religious freedom isn't so much from the government, is this from us feeling like, well, freedom is what I want to do. But it's, it's, you know, in this regard, I think it's what we're called to do. Uh, and what we're called to do is suffer, you know, with each other. I don't think we really have real community and real solidarity. I don't think we make any real movement forward uh, with, uh, without responding to that call to some sort of suffering, you know. Uh, and I think a lot of your responses really kind of helped me frame that, that again, in my own mind, that, you know, justice and mercy and all of that comes together, uh, you know, for Christians on the cross, I think people of other faiths, they have that same notion. I mean, like, you know, uh, Muslims just uh, celebrated Ramadan a month ago, you know, they understand suffering. Uh, I think many, many perspectives of faith talk about there is a sacrifice, you know, that there's something ha you have to give something in order to uh, receive some benefits. So uh, our time is up. Uh, I really want to thank all of you, you know, from all of the members of the ASP that you guys came, uh, the attendees, uh, you know, I hope, I hope you enjoyed this se session. And like I said, I wish I had two hours to spend with each of you individually, but uh, this has been great. Uh, thank you so much.